board right here. As soon as you hear it, we're good to go. <laughs> this conference will now be recorded. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, welcome everybody uh, to the City of Esquan Planning Commission meeting. Um, uh, if the rescheduled uh, Planning Commission meeting uh, dated June 16th, 2020 at 7 uh, p.m. Uh, if we can all join in the uh, flag salute, we'll start with that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, States of America and to the republic, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty, and, liberty and justice for all. Great, thank you. Uh, and uh, roll call. Chair Sarkozy. Here. Commissioner Danzinger. Here. Commissioner Willis. Here. Commissioner Stroman. Here. And I made wrong the right today. And <laughs> and uh, Vice Chair Castellanos. Here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, with, with that, I just want to comment that uh, this meeting is being conducted by teleconference pursuant to the Brown Act waiver provided under Governor Gavin Newsom's executive order in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, let's see here. So moving on to uh, presentations and the agenda is none. I'll assume nothing has changed from that. And then we'll go on to the consent uh, calendar, the approval of the minutes, minutes from uh, May, 19, May 19th, 2020. Any comments or corrections from the other commissioners? I move okay. that we approve the minutes of the May 19th meeting. I'll second. Okay. okay. Uh, with a motion and a second, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Okay. Motion passed 5 0. Okay. Um, next um, will be the public. Hearing about uh, project application 20-673C, uh, which is an ordinance 565 uh, amendment. The, the staff report. Thank you, Chair Sarkozy. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. This is Diana, Assistant Planner. Before you tonight is an amendment to a previously approved ordinance, that's number 565 for the Lear Village Plan Development, B1. Uh, Planning Commission recommended and City Council adopted this ordinance for the plan development in 2018. And the approved design for this project included eight townhouses, a commercial office, a storage building, and all associated landscaping, common areas, and parking lots. After the approvals were received, uh, that developer went through building plan review, civil site plan review. The developer constructed all of the civil plan improvements. Uh, the HOA and CCR documents were drafted and reviewed. The applicant, the developer went through final map review and received approval on that final map and the developers finalizing all the logistical details for this project. Um, through that set of plan reviews, construction, and approval for the final map, uh, the developer realized that a couple of changes um, would benefit the project. And so the developer has submitted this ordinance amendment request to modify the lot size and coverage charts, as well as a condition of approval for storage. So we'll talk about the lot sizes and coverage chart first. Um, from when the tentative map was recommended by Planning Commission and approved by Council, 
through the process to final map, some minor lot line adjustments were made. And these were made to accommodate a rear access path, as well as some adjustments that were needed for PG&E utilities and their minimum setback requirements. The city city engineer reviewed these lot changes as it went through final map review. And the engineer explained that it's very common on subdivisions to have these minor lot changes between the tentative map and the final map. Um, and the city engineer is able to approve those small changes, which he did, and the final map was adopted. Um, the chart, Exhibit B, uh, is updated to reflect these lot size and coverage changes, and it's being included, included in this ordinance update just to make sure that the ordinance on file is accurate. The other change that the developer is looking through this ordinance amendment is in regards to on-site storage. So just a little bit of background. Um, this project was required to have secured storage for the residences. And in very early conversations with the developer, uh, between developer and staff, it was explained that the project would require secured storage for the residences. And this was for two reasons. Uh, the first, the zoning code, which is separate from the building code, who can, would handle it different, but the zoning code of Escalon defines multiple family residential as a building that has four or more independent attached units. And this accurately describes the former police department building, one building with four attached independent units inside. Um, and the zoning code requires multifamily residential to have secured storage. And the other reason is that the density of this project when calculated out equated with the R2 medium density residential projects and those R2 zoning standards required the secured storage for residential. And then secured storage is just an individual protected unit where they can store items like bicycles, barbecues, outdoor equipment, and it sets a minimum size six feet high, eight feet wide, five feet deep. So in these early discussions, staff directed the developer to include secure storage for the project. Um, as this was a planned development, um, staff uh, under the planned development requirements under the zoning code, it has high standards of development and planned developments need to provide adequate amenities. Um, in reviewing these regulations, because the lot sizes are minimal, and none of these townhouses had garages. It made sense uh, to require that secured storage as explained in the code. Um, the developer proposed the standalone storage building. Uh, it would be one large building on the original approved plan and it would have individual storage units inside. Um, so the plan development was approved with this storage building. It's called building D on the plans and you can see those in exhibit C and D. And the approved purpose, uh, the understood use of the building was that each of the eight residential lots would receive one storage unit. And then the commercial office on Main Street would be assigned two storage units. As the developer progressed through drafting the CCNR and the HOA documents and financing contracts, uh, he encountered some issues that the storage building couldn't be utilized as originally approved. And this was because of the way that it was structured. The storage building was substantially increasing the monthly HOA fees for each of the lots. Um, and it was posing a financial detriment to the whole project. And so the developers requesting as part of this ordinance, ordinance amendment, an alternative way to provide the secured storage for the residences and then repurpose building D. So in regards to secured storage, uh, the developer is proposing attic space which in, within each of the eight residential units. And if you can look at exhibit F, you can see four plans for each of the attic spaces. Four of the units uh, would need to have a ladder provided by the homeowner to access that storage. And the other four units have a drop down panel. So the panel, a ladder comes down out of the attic storage. Uh, and then there's a chart that just kind of summarizes the size and the shape of each of those storage units. And staff does have some concerns on some of the units. The height on several units 
um, is less than four feet high. And staff could see that the homeowners of those units uh, would have difficulty ask, ac accessing the full area of the storage space just because you would have to crawl um, to, the, to reach the back. And then also that would limit the size of items that could be stored up there. And then a few of the units do not have a drop down ladder. The owners would have to provide their own. Um, since the ceiling height is about eight feet tall, you would need about a seven foot ladder to be able to climb up into the attic space. And the homeowners don't really have a good place to store the ladder because they don't have a garage or a, an outside storage unit. Um, uh, staff has had past discussions with the developer regarding the storage options. Um, and some ideas other than attic storage was discussed, and this includes storage sheds put in the yards of the lot. Um, the lots are smaller, um, so they have smaller yard areas, which um, wasn't sure, staff wasn't sure that a storage, a storage shed would take up some of their backyard space. Also, there were some stormwater drainage concerns, and in two of the units, the public utilities um, would go under the sheds, which would not be allowed. Um, so if attic storage is accepted on the residential, for the residential lot, the developer is requesting that building D be repurposed. Instead of being dedicated storage unit for the residences, that the building would become a general warehouse storage building for the commercial office on Main Street. That's also called lot nine. So the lot 9010, the commercial office on Main Street, and the storage building would be owned by the same person or company. They could not be leased or sold separately. Um, and the developers are requesting that the use of that building just be left open to general warehouse and storage for the commercial office. And the zoning code does define warehouse and storage. It could either be individual stalls that are rented or leased for goods or wares, but it could also be used for storage and distribution of wholesale goods. Um, warehouse and storage, it doesn't include direct sales, so it couldn't become a retail office, couldn't be an office, couldn't be used for manufacturing, no assembly of goods, no storing of animals, and no use of flammable or hazardous, hazardous substances or waste. Um, so staff sees that the general warehouse storage a use could be used for things like office storage, building material storage, vehicle storage, part storage, product storage, something like that. So the business would be the commercial office on Main Street, and that building would just be a warehouse for whatever products that that type of business has. Um, and building D, so there's a variety of uses, you know, whether it's office paperwork, whether it's vehicles, um, the building would have to be constructed to building code standards for each type of occupancy. So if the building is constructed for one type of occupancy and the building, the commercial office and the warehouse are future sold um, to a different business who wants to use it for something else, it would have to have you know, they would have to use the same occupancy it was built for, or they would have to make modifications to the warehouse to accommodate the use that they want to use. Um, and an additional option that the developer is including with that is that the owner of that warehouse building could construct these temporary um, chain link fence storage areas and actually lease it to the houses within the development. So there could be an option, but it's not required that those residences could have um, at least part of that building for individual storage. And if the, if the building D is approved to be a warehouse for the commercial office, no part of it would be allowed to be used for living quarters. If building D is repurposed into general warehouse storage for the office, um, that does come with parking requirements out of the zoning code. The zoning code would require one parking space and a bicycle rack. Originally, when the building D was approved as um, individual storage units for the residences, there was a loading zone provided. And so that 
developer would just repurpose that loading zone space into a parking space. It was the same, it was an appropriate size for a parking space. So they've taken care of their one parking space. And then the commercial office has a parking, has a bike rack with space for three bicycles, which could also take care of the bicycle needs of the warehouse. Uh, the developer has made some revisions to the floor plan and the exterior elevation of building D to accommodate the warehouse use. You can see that in exhibit E. And so before planning commission tonight um, is to make a recommendation to council in regards to the chart as well as the secured storage. And there's a variety of options. Um, the applicant has requested in regards to secured storage that the attic space storage be allowed as to accommodate for the secured storage for the residences and then the building be repurposed into general warehouse. Um, so the planning commission could decide any of the following things. Um, the eight residences within Lear Village do not need secured star storage and just remove the requirement. So if building D is not used for storage for the residences, if sheds in the yards is not a good option, if attic space is not a good option, it's a planned development, it's open, um, open to different amenities. So planning commission could recommend that no storage is required. Uh, planning commission could make a recommendation to allow the attic storage as proposed or modified as needed. For example, if drop down ladders um, be provided in all of the units. Planning commission could recommend um, that secured storage be allowed through small sheds in the yards and the two yards where the sheds don't fit. Um, planning commission could recommend waiving the storage requirements for those two units or require the storage in the attic. And then the other part of the storage is in regards to building D. Planning commission could recommend that building D gets modified is regards to the use, the floor plans and the elevations that it become a general warehouse storage building that has to be owned and used by the commercial business on Main Street, cannot be used for living quarters, cannot be leased or used by any person or business that is not part of the Lear Village plan development. Planning Commission could recommend that buildings D's use floor plan and elevation remain as originally approved and its individual secured storage for the residences and commercial business or through discussions tonight, Planning Commission could agree upon um, a different recommendation or different conditions than what's in the packet. Um, so what we need to do tonight uh, to move this forward, open the public hearing and take any public comment, close the public hearing. You have to make a motion to make the findings for section 65860A of the government code. Number four, make a recommendation to city council to amend ordinance 565 to update the lot sizes and coverage chart and recommend to city council uh, to amend ordinance 565 in regards to conditions of approval for storage and then come up with a recommendation on the storage. Um, the applicant should be on the line tonight, the developer, uh, Mr. Lear should be on the line tonight so if Planning Commission has any questions, um, they should be able to direct them to the applicant if you don't have any questions for staff. That's all I got. Okay, great, thank you, Diana, appreciate that. Um, before we open the public, um, public comment time, are there any questions for staff that need to be uh, clarified at this point? I have a question. This is Dean. Um, the project was initially approved. Was it approved for affordable housing? So what was the initial intent uh, of this development? The project did not have any affordable housing restrictions on it. Um, 
the developers expressed on several occasions that just their price point for the project will be moderate income it's not high income it's not very low income around moderate but there are no city of Escalon restrictions when it comes to affordable housing and the reason why the city adopted a PD development was just to get this vacant building developed into some other use so the reason that the this project was developed uh, as a planned development is because it is the former City Hall and Police Department which was city owned property so at the beginning of this uh, project when the properties were up for sale they had put out advertisements and asked people to propose certain types of projects and this out of the proposals that were given to the council uh, was what the type of project that the council was looking for um, the mixed use where there is a commercial office building um, but then also some some housing in the form of townhomes that would be located in our downtown the city municipal code also requires townhouses are only allowed under a plan development so as the applicant was wanting to do townhouses um, it's not an R1 an R2 an R3 um, it had to be a plan development okay I, I have no other questions Diane I have one um, if my memory serves the initial application uh, staff had, had made it clear that I think the storage building I don't know if it was a storage building or a parking lot uh, was the first thing that they wanted to see built uh, can you refresh me on that yeah that was that storage building D um, because the project is phased there was a phase one two and three phase one was the former police department building and because the code required secured storage for these units oh staff uh, Originally, the building, storage building D was going to be in the final phase. Staff recommended that the storage building be moved up into phase one so that as those four units in the old police department building were finished and occupied, they would already have storage available and not have to wait until the end of phase three. Okay, and uh, I, I think that the whole project got a, uh, approved with that in mind uh, initially. And I uh, was there any discussion about not using it for secured storage for the tenants anywhere up until this point? Um, up until the point the project was approved, uh, the storage building was for the residents of the plan development. After it was approved and the developer started going through um, financing and HOA uh, contract documents, that's when it started to come up that um, that issue about the way the storage building is designed and approved it would raise the HOA fees to a point that becomes a detriment to the project and so that's when conversations started between staff and the developer about alternatives for storage okay I have the rest of my questions will be for uh, at the leaders I'm sorry. Did, did you say you had a did you say you had a question for me? Uh, no, not 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 quite yet. Okay. I have a different um, take on the whole. I have a different take on it a little bit from my perspective as well, from where we started to where we are now. But okay. we're going to open the we'll public hearing in a moment. little bit. David. Yeah, we're going to open the public hearing in a little bit, David, sure. and that's when sure. I sure. can do. Okay. Sure. Is a question I had, uh, you know, if, if we were to forego the storage requirement in Building D, would that, I guess, potentially then that could uh, adjust the requirement to build that building first? Is that we can also suggest that too, because there wouldn't be that need? That's correct. The only reason it was bumped up to Phase 1, where the developer originally proposed it in Phase 3, uh, was just to accommodate uh, the storage for the residents in the former police department building. So if building D is gonna become general warehouse for the commercial office, 
there isn't any reason that it needs to be included in phase one. Okay. Thank you. Commissioners, any other questions for staff? Not yet. Okay. Uh, great. So, uh, 725, why don't we open it up, uh, open the public hearing um, for the project. And um, maybe Mr. Lear, if you could uh, just state, state your name and your address just for the record. Sure. It's David Lear. 1977 St. John Road, Escalon, California, 95320. Great, thank you. Thanks for, thanks for coming and uh, helping explain uh, the changes here. Okay. Well, I think, yeah, I think initially, I, I have some things that I wrote down that might help just to read it, but um, I, had, I had written that the following has been noted on several occasions for various statement by the city of Esquan its staff and the city council that quote unquote the developer was aware of the storage requirement quote unquote for each of the townhomes at, at its original proposal proposal and inception this is from my perspective or a developer's perspective categorically incorrect uh, the municipal code requirement for storage under the presumption of multifamily housing was not considered at the time of its conception. This would not be an area any developer would consider during its conceptualization of the project for individual townhouses, which are normally considered single family residences. It was the intent of the developer to build the storage building as a separate investment property, which is why it was parceled out separately, which would be leased to either the HOA or residents or tenants of the Lear Village project individually. The conditions of approval state the storage building is deed restricted for use by Lear Village PD1 residents only. The developer was told the building must be built during phase one because the storage had become a requirement or guidelines which applies to multifamily housing. The city of Esplan had resumed municipal codes and ordinances based upon a multifamily housing approach to its development. The commercial property purchase agreement confirmed the estimated permit rates for the project which were provided in Exhibit A, Exhibit B, and Exhibit C of the purchase contract. At that time, the multifamily rate was apply applied to both Building A and Building B. Uh, CSG Consultants Incorporated, which is a city consultant with regards to planning and other building codes, applied the ADA guidelines for multifamily to the Lear Village project on March 30th, 2017, specifically Building A which included many site redesigns for ADA parking on that lot, then and then later. And Suprell, the city attorney, confirmed to Diana, to Diana Trejo that buildings with four or more residential units should be charged the multifamily rate. Developer was also told verbally the storage requirement would only apply to building A. There were also other design plans showing developer utilizing existing sewer lines for building A which would be allowed if the city or its consultants determine the applicable building codes to the project be multifamily. The BTSM, Investing Connect Subdivision Map, dated March 30th of 2017, acknowledges some new underground, but also confirms existing on-site utility to be utilized by the developer, which included existing sewer lines located under building A. The CTNRs also were designed to reflect that condition. Our initial sets were also designed around a multifamily approach to these buildings. In summary, it was not clear which municipal codes and our guidelines would be applied to the Lear Village project. However, the developer made assumptions based upon this multifamily approach and plan accordingly. Provided certain deed restrictions and the, tr and the term, quote unquote, storage requirement, the storage building itself became a part of the, of the infrastructure. The resulting loss to the development would total approximately three hundred thousand dollars. I'll explain this because it's a little difficult to understand why that why that's the case, which is presently the entire margin for the development. This does not take into account the increased cost of additional underground, conservatively a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand, probably around one hundred fifty thousand for the land, which was provided at developer's sole cost, loss and expense in addition paying liquidated damages to the city of Esquan. In short, the push 
to require developers to provide both storage units under a non-existent municipal code, which does not apply to this project, and additionally provide for additional underground for single-family residents to be in error. And that's where I've landed pretty much on that. <laughs> I have lots of other things. I could speak to the delays in the project, why we've had delays, but I can explain briefly what happened with the storage, uh, storage building when you make it a requirement. And it's no longer an investment property as it was had intended to be, as it was parceled separately. At the real, original conception, that was entirely the case. And, and you know, I was surprised actually when I was told it was a requirement and that it had to be built in phase one. I actually expressed shock to Diana verbally, like, why are we having to do this? So I figured maybe we just try to figure it out. And I try to work it in somehow, but when we were drafted the CCNRs, I asked the attorney, I said, you know, they keep saying requirement. And I'm concerned that this is going to be looked at like water, sewer, electrical, or any other requirement, you know, like an infrastructure cost. And he had not expressed concern until I had brought it up, and he said he thought that probably would express some concern to the development from a legal uh, perspective because somebody could say, well, I'm just not going to pay you know, anything to the HOA or individually because it's required that the developer provide it. So this term storage department just keeps coming back and becoming a major issue, even though it's not even in the municipal code. The reason that it has such a detrimental value to the project, this is, this is, this is it, if I can explain it or explain it in a way that is easy to understand. Um, the appraiser, when they appraise those four units at Building A, he said he could assign, assign no value whatsoever to those storage units because of the maintenance fee associated with the requirement and having to have it. So there's no value added to the project. So right away, the entire cost of the building is in the gate, 165000 Or maybe we could factor back in the two commercial units and say there's some value to the commercial. But it's still around $145,000 infrastructure cost right there. There's no way to get that back. Secondly, because of the maintenance fee, which is a requirement, right back to requirement, of $47 a month per tenant to pay to the HOA, that's just a maintenance that doesn't take into account covering the cost of building the building itself. That $47 a month limits the borrowing power of a buyer on each of those units of around $8,000. Now you could say, well, why don't you just charge $8,000 more? Well, I can't because I'm at market cap with these units because of comparable property sales in the city of Escalon. So not only do I get hit with 147 infrastructure costs, 147 that which I just, I guess, have to eat under the storage requirement that's not in the code. This is why I've just been so frustrated over this. But then I also have to take another $8,000 hit for each of the units when it comes to selling them. So it turns into a $300,000 loss. And I've made this so apparent to the staff on so many different occasions that this is very difficult for me because you're enforcing this on me when it's not in the code, and I've already agreed to not argue for the liquidated damages clause. I've already agreed to take another $100,000 in personal losses to this city to have to be out there and do the on offsite improvements myself because the city required it. And because I have integrity, I stood by my word to this contract and I put in that underground. And I had to take all the losses, but I did it anyways, and I call that integrity. So I don't understand why the staff is coming here with this report saying that I knew about this requirement and that I understood from its inception that I had planned this based on that at all. I did not plan it on that. This, my experience in doing this prior to this development, 15 years ago, I had planned storage units because the majority of the downtown redevelopment projects in an actual, a very large inner city had, had just included it. And in many cases, they would lease it back or include it in the HOA much like parking stalls in San Francisco and in other areas where they try to figure out how to cover the cost of providing these types of things, which actually make sense for the development, but providing these types of things for people buying in. I understand the reason why they want the storage. I get it. I'd like to provide it. The city council, actually, there's two members of the city council that actually are the ones that had the idea of the attic spaces because they didn't like the storage building. So we designed the attic spaces so it could be included. I had not figured that into the original cost. So what I'm trying to do with this building is just make it break even. That's why I'm, I'm proposing general warehouse and storage and proposing overflow storage for the residents so that not only do they get the storage in their house, which I hadn't planned, but I'm gonna pay for them too, 
not only do they get that, but if they would like to lease overflow storage, I'd be more than happy to provide it in the unit. The reason that I don't want it to be a requirement, these terms that just place conditions on the property itself, that run continuous with the property forever, is that what if one of the, because now the commercial office unit and the storage building, even though they're parceled separately, they have to be financed together because of these deed restrictions. So it made everything very complicated from a developer perspective and just being able to utilize this, you know, it, uh, or, 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 or to have any real viability for anybody else buying in. So I'm just trying to figure out how to make that work. But I just got off track there. Um, blah, 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 blah. There, there might be somebody in that commercial office who owns that storage building that doesn't get along with somebody, let's say, on lot one or lot three, or they, they've had contentious, contentious uh, arguments or something, or there's something happening there. And now it's a requirement that they provide access at all times to an office, to a, a warehouse building that maybe they have some of their stuff in. It just becomes a legal issue or a potential li litigation issue down the road, which is why mixed use developments in general, I don't know of a mixed use development like this or of any kind in 20 years in the Central Valley that anybody's even tried to attempt to do. All the consultants and professionals on this project have said this is a 10 plus complicated project. So it's things like this, I'm just trying to avoid having issues down the road and open up the versatility and viability of that building just so it's a break even to the project. That's all I'm trying to do, to, to do at this point. It makes sense to me, but I'd be open to other recommendations. But from a developer perspective where mostly I'm analyzing risk and trying to mitigate it so that the project stays viable, I, I'm just trying to get the whole thing to pencil. That's all I'm trying to do, and I've, I've just taken so many losses at this point. I just need to finish this project and come out of it. That's where I stand with it. Right now. But I'm open to suggestions if you were to have any. Okay, uh, great. Thank you for that uh, summary, Mr. Lear. I pre appreciate it. Um, good, good background history, and certainly are uh, passionate about the project. Um, I know as I was looking through the, uh, I'm just looking at Exhibit F, for example, and refreshing my memory, and I mean, it's going to be beautiful when it's when it's done. Um, can't wait to see it. It's been a been a long time coming, and it'll it'll get there. Um, yeah. Uh, so appreciate all the work you're doing, um, commissioners. Um, why don't we? I'll just go down the, go down the, go down the row with any uh, any questions uh, you might have. And I think uh, Kurt, you're up first. Uh, all right, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, I'm. I, I guess I'm a little slow, but I'm confused about the HOA fees becoming a problem. Uh, if, if you have to build the storage building versus building the storage building and then leasing back a, a, a page, apparently, uh, to the homeowners, what, what, what's the price difference there? Are, are, you, are you asking me th that question? That's Mr. Lear. Okay, yeah. I had originally figured for around $100 a unit, which I figured would cover about the cost of that and keep it as an investment property and cover the maintenance costs associated with the HOA. And um, our HOAs right now, not including the storage unit, are right at, I think they were at 272 $272 a month per unit. I was trying to shave that down, getting it to like closer to 250 There might be some room there. But the state mandates those requirements. So there's like there's nothing we can do about what the state's mandating in, in, in that way. So it, it what once we get like three hundred and seventy five dollars a month as a requirement is is excessive. For modern uh, housing. What do you uh, what do you surmise would be the rental fee charged back to uh, the tenants? And, and and are we just talking about the first four tenants? Or are we talking about all eight? Well, later, what it was told, what I was told later was that that even though they had confirmed and then CSG later, because CSG had made a mistake on building A and said it was multifamily, and they required ADA for all four units and ADA access and ADA parking, so we were all over the place going back to working drawing, and then they said that they had made a mistake and it's actually single family, and then the city confirmed it was single. Dominique confirmed it was city or sorry, single family. At that point, I said, well, then, why do we even have to provide the storage under the, uh, the municipal code? 
And she said, well, it's more or less going to become the general guidelines for this project. So I think at that point it was just no it's requirement for the project itself as a general guideline. So it's not just the four. It, it's definitely, well, I don't really know what it is, but it's eight right now. <laughs> that's, that's where we're at. Uh, uh, Dominique, are these uh, R2, R3s, or R1s in building uh, A? Uh, for building, so according to the municipal code, this the section uh, in the municipal code advises that multifamily has a, has a storage requirement, and I think it's eight by five by six or something like that. Um, and and our code does identify structures with four or more units as multifamily. So building A, the fourplex, if you will, is multifamily or they're single family? According to the municipal so, code, go ahead, Diana. Under, under city municipal code, uh, four attached independent units is considered multifamily. But under building code, the way building A, the former police department is, is single family. It, it, it has to do with, go ahead. Well, in the framing, it, you know, like when we did the scenic river townhouses over there on Scenic Avenue, there's, you have to provide a fire separation. There's actually a two inch, uh, there's a two inch airspace between two separate interior demising walls. That's your property line. So you have to frame up and out, out and, or you, she rock up and out with a one hour fire rating so that's that's a requirement to provide the individual property lanes or uh, property lines that classify it as single family so Escalon got that? something that yeah we're doing that so okay so they're single yeah right. yeah we have separate sewer now separate electrical separate water so everything i mean we have 20 we have eight football fields now at new underground we just went over the electrical today we have 1200 lineal feet just for electrical and cable alone all on that existing site. So this thing just turned into a monstrosity for underground, which is part of the reason why it's taking forever, but. Okay, well, let me, let me just give you a little, what I feel. Uh, when we, we first got this project there and uh, uh, we, we were under the uh, R2, R3 uh, assumption that there has to be designated secured storage. I think everybody was in favor of that. I don't think you knew at the time the headache that was going to create for you. Um, yeah. But these these facilities, in my mind anyway, are, are small and, and they need some kind of storage. And I don't I don't really care for the uh, attic storage. I, I've got a fairly newer house and I don't use my attic storage uh, at all because I don't want to step up there and I certainly don't want flammables up there. Uh, as was in the report here. But, uh, People may want to store a barbecue or you know gas and that kind of thing. I, at, at first, I was leaning in one way, but now I'm leaning another way. Uh, the, what I don't like about your recommendation with the the building having these metal storage areas that might be leased at the discretion of the owner, I, I'd rather not not be your discretion. If, you, if the people who want to rent one from you, and they should have the ability to do that. And and are you opposed? Are you opposed to rewarding uh, your your comments here so that they would have first choice of refusal? You know, if 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 we were to do it under those guidelines, would I be allowed to provide uh, uh, the individual? They they have like eight by eight. Uh, units that are mobile inside the storage facility and you, you can make them larger even smaller but we'd probably stay within like an 8 by 8 or something and probably with the mesh covering and you know I could put five on one wall very easily and it all has you know you know locks uh, like padlocks on them and we'd probably have secured access during certain hours so you know, if we knew them and everything was fine, and of course, you know, they could have access, you know, during normal business hours, but not something where they might be coming and going at midnight. 
So there would be certain probably provisions that would make sense that would be kind of commonplace with commercial office space management. So not exactly like commercial storage, but kind of similar to it. It'd be kind of a creative approach to that. We could do something like that and do that, yeah. When you say eight by eight, eight by eight by what? By eight. Yeah, we could oh, probably okay, do so like eight by eight by eight. Okay, so, so that would ask, is that uh, 240 cubic feet? Anybody left, Sean? <laughs> um, well, it, it'd be nice if like we could do, like, you know, go ahead and provide the attic storage so it meets a, like a requirement and then provide overflow storage in this capacity. And let's say maybe we have, you know, five available or something. Maybe we have a number, you know, four or five available. And those are available, uh, you know, at the or first choice or at the option of the tenants only that reside there at the Lear Village. You know, you, would that would that make sense? What, what, when you say five, does that mean that the, when the whole uh, project is built out, that three of three tenants wouldn't be able to have one or, or be able to lease one? Well. I, I'm thinking of it as overflow storage, so they would actually pay for the overflow storage. Oh, no, I get that. I, but okay. When I'm, go, when I'm going here, I get the material that again. I don't like the out of storage. I, yeah, if there's something like that's available, yeah, okay. But if there's something out there where somebody can put their bikes in the stuff. Uh, yeah. You're pretty, pretty muffled right now. Got a food, so. It, if I hear okay. you say there will be eight, um, eight, yeah, uh, eight of these, uh, whatever they are, rollers or what have you, available, um, mm -hmm. I might be willing to listen to that. Okay, if maybe maybe I could put together a um, maybe like a floor plan, like kind of lay something out. I mean, maybe then in that case, I mean, are you wanting there to be at least a, a, a available at all times or can that be kind of, you know, we could set them up on an as needed basis? Well, you're not gonna need them all at once, but uh, as yeah. the place uh, fills out, hopefully soon as you get it done, uh, I, I, mm -hmm. I think that the people there should have an opportunity to whoever's leasing it uh, to, to lease it first. If they turn it down, you know, you got it in writing, and you know, away you go. Okay. Yeah, if I could have some chance maybe on the floor plan, then yeah, then I, then I could get more, be more specific with size, you know. That, that, that has been actually one of the first buyers, he's a local Escalon guy, real smart guy. He, um, he said his wife would like, she could rent two or three of those, she would have taken it, you know, um, if, if it was an option for overflow. Uh, but then no, there will be other people who are more budget sensitive, you know. Right. Um, a question for staff, uh, uh, Diane, uh, your, your take on what we were just discussing, is that, uh, does that conflict with the, uh, the E or, or whatever the uh, building D's uh, warehouse permits. Um. So what I understood is that um, eight of those chain link storage units would be available on a needed basis. Um, each of the eight residential townhomes would be guaranteed a space if they wanted it, so they don't all have to be put up at once. But some someone says, you know, I want one, then it'll be put up for them. But they're not required to take it if they don't want to, only if they want it and they would pay for it and that they'd be able to access it during during office hours. Um, I mean, this is a plan development. Uh, planning Commission has the discretion uh, to evaluate the storage needs of the residents and, and choose you know, the municipal code says R2 density, which this is an R2 density, should have some re some secured storage for the residences. How that's accomplished, it's, it's at the discretion, um, a recommendation of, of planning commission and the adoption of council. So if this is the way that it gets accomplished, then that works. 
the um, there's there's a concern if if the uh, tenant does rent one of these out and and can't put flammable liquids in there or gas because it's a warehouse storage and, and it's not allowed to do that. Um, I, I I don't know how that pencils out for you, Mr. Lear. Um, if you're still having to build to uh, I guess a, a storage unit uh, guideline uh, versus a uh, warehouse. Yeah, I if, if you know if we were to go five by six by eight, or maybe go. I mean, if you're wanting a minimum size available on a first choice, which which could be you know for rent at, at a five by six by eight, um, and we go with kind of more or less a one size fits all. We don't go down to a four by four if somebody wanted that for less money. We just stay at five by six by eight which we have room in there for those. And I guess you could say up to eight at any given time, um, you know, if it be the case. Um, I guess we could probably try to make that work. You know, have a designated area, you know, for those eight and as overflow. Um, could probably figure that out. I, I think we could probably figure that out. Just thinking the length of the building itself is 50 feet, so we got 50. Yeah, we could probably we could probably put them all on one wall. And all right. Then, now, right here's the big. We could probably make it work. Yeah. It's okay, and that's wonderful. Here's the big question: it, It's going to be what you call that building, and that's what I'm asking you, Diana. Uh, is if people store flammable liquids in there, like a barbecue or what have you, does, does that disallow it being called a warehouse storage? Commissioner Danzinger, before Diana answers that, I need to step in for a second. And that is, Go ahead. once I think by going through this rigmarole, we are adding substantial cost to the project that, quite honestly, Mr. Lear, can't afford because the minute that you put flammable liquids in that storage, now you're having to add fire sprinklers. And anytime you add fire sprinklers to a building, it drives the cost up exponentially. And so I, I think, uh, I think Mr. Lear mentioned at the beginning of the call that, you know, it's, uh, could be problematic, uh, by building this building alone. Now we're talking about having to Oh, did I lose that? Okay. Well, let me fill in. Um, Diane, is, is that true? Would they have to do that building? That's a question we'll have to ask the building department. That would be a building code requirement. This this building D structure is not super large. I think it's 1,900 square feet. And I believe it would fall under the minimum size to require fire sprinklers. Even if there was, there would probably be some limits to how much flammable could be stored, you know, a limit to how many gallons of gasoline could be stored under it before fire sprinklers are required. If I could remember correctly, I think the building needs to be four or 5,000 square feet before fire sprinklers are required. Um, but the, there is a condition in there that However, however the occupancy is used, the building would have to be um, built to building code standards for that use. So if, the, if when Mr. Lear sends in his building plans to CSG for plan review or a, whatever occupancy building, you know, that may have some flammable stored in it, they would plan check it to that and make sure that all the building code requirements are met for that use. And, and then I would say that uh, if that comes back and they are required, then I would uh, I would uh, put a proviso in there that Lear Development might put restrictions on type of materials in those cages so that they don't incur that cost. Yeah, that those details could be included in the HOAs and CCNRs, you know, for those individual storage units. He could definitely limit what type of materials are allowed to be stored or not stored in there. 
I, I, I don't want to make it a, a deal breaker. We're just trying to get some secured storage uh, for the tenants there. And if, if that's a real deal breaker there, then hey, you know, you can you can make those restrictions uh, in your HOA PPRs. Yeah. Now, would that would that also mean that I would not need to provide the attic storage? <laughs> I'm not sure if I, I might need to provide both. Just curious. We were doing well, top ceilings and all those, but I mean, we we designed if you're for you're not going to provide that. If you don't want to provide that, then you should uh, include these storage units in their HOAs. So I'll leave that okay, up to you. Okay. No, I, I I no, I prefer it the other way. Yeah, I mean, it really does. The requirement on that building, it it just kills the project. <laughs> so, um, the underground alone would have done it had I, you know, had I not actually gone out there in the field and, and been doing a lot of it myself, which I'm not as good as the guys that do it all the time, obviously. But, um, but um, yeah. So, no, I think the overflow and it being at the discretion from a business standpoint or investment standpoint, uh, you know, in commercial buildings, we use capitalization approaches. But basically, it's just... It, it, it adds value to the building because you can, you know, lease it for for income, for for rental purposes. So if there's a win-win in there, then you know I'm for win-win situations. Anytime you get into requirements, you know, quote-unquote requirements, uh, there are deed restrictions that run with the property, and any investment like banks, they look at those things. Sometimes it makes it tougher to even get financing on something because of things like that. So. The more free market and versatility you can bri provide on anything, of course, it, it, it makes sense. You know, it helps. But um, I think we can make something work here. I think the five by six by eight foot tall, I could probably line up eight on a wall maybe. Or, or I doubt they'll all be rented any, any, anyways all one time, as long as there's a first choice. And then maybe we have some language in there like, you know, what does that mean exactly? So if, if let's say a commercial tenant goes in there and there's four of the tenants that elected to have these units and the guy says, okay, well, I'm going to store tile or whatever, whatever it is. And the other portion of that building, does that mean that if one of these tenants says, well, I, I, I would like to, you know, take my first option and put one of these four by fours that the tile guy says, well, I got to move that tile out of that area and maybe off site because I don't have the room now for it because I have to provide this. Well, well our, concern mean that, is, probably. our concern is the tenant. You know, the other step is yeah. the other step. Okay. Yeah, they're first come, first serve. Okay. Okay. Uh, Great, thank you, uh, Commissioner Danzinger. Do you have any uh, anything else you wanted to add? Not at this point. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Stroman. So, Mr. Lear, uh, I just have a yeah. couple quick questions. So, sure. I'm a little slow um, this evening, and, and quite honestly, I got a little bit confused in the previous conversation. Um, okay. But are you saying that you were under the impression that Building A, which is the former police station, was all along was considered single family uh, residence, um, and then Building B was considered multifamily, and then through your working drawing uh, application, it was determined by plan check. Uh, through plan check review comments that no, the, the interpretation of building A was not single family. The plan checker identified it as multifamily, and then that's when the requirements kicked in for the storage building. Um, the opposite actually is true. The opposite. Okay, can you clarify yeah, so, that for me, please? Sure. Yeah, so uh, because of the, well, so I guess the city had looked at building A as a multifamily. Okay. And even I think at that time they considered B to also be multifamily. And 
and they gave me the permit structure for those buildings based on multifamily. And um, we attached those to the contract, which is how we negotiated purchase price. Okay. Which, so I understood the underground, like the site underground for the entire project to be multifamily. And I, and I assumed we were approaching it that way. Now as a broker, I mean, I've been doing this for a while and condos are typically considered multifamily. Townhouses are typically considered single family. But different cities do this differently sometimes. So there sometimes isn't exactly a you know, one size fits all. It's some, sometimes it's a little interesting what certain cities allow and what they don't. So sometimes they'll say, okay, you're single family here, here, and here, but on sewer, we're going to allow you to use common sewer underneath the whole building. Okay. Like, so there's, there's variations to it. So I had planned for site underground, that's the on-off site improvement, for multifamily. And I, of course, had planned the permits for multifamily as well. Okay. Um, and then, and CSG was saying multifamily. And the attorney was saying multifamily permits. And everybody was saying multifamily, so I assumed multifamily. Well, when we went through plan check on building A, he had said, well, building code then is multifamily. So he was having me go back to working drawings to, to make sure that each of the four units was ADA accessible. And I had to provide ADA accessibility. So we were like going back trying to figure out how we're gonna include a ramp without changing the elevations and what are we gonna do to these side yards? Because this is a great change on building A. It goes from like nine inches above grade to 15 inches above grade as you kind of turn around that building. I don't know if you noticed that, but so we were, we were like, you know, how are we going to make this all work? We're changing, you know, it's tight spaces. We're trying to figure it all out, trying to make it all work. Well, then months after that, it was around about two and a half months, maybe going on three. He called me and the guy, I'll have to be honest, I thought this was a real stand-up guy. Because he called me and said, hey, I made a mistake. It's actually single family residents are bad, but now you know. <laughs> so I actually thought, wow, <laughs> it's kind of big of him to say that. It was a big mistake. So we went back to an original site. I mean, we were redesigning the entire site to get the parking in. I mean, we were moving things all over the place. Okay, so, so we let, went me, back let, me, let me interrupt sure. you. Sure. So sure. the minute that you went into single family, that's what started the storage unit that we're discussing tonight? Uh, yeah, that's part of it. I, I, didn't, I honestly did not know it was a requirement, and there, I did not know on any level when I had proposed it. I literally just told the designer, I think it makes sense for the project to provide storage for these tenants. Let's go ahead and build it as a separate parcel. We'll lease it back to the HOA. It's a little bit of a creative idea, but I thought it made sense because, you know, uh, like parking, you know, like when you don't have the parking and you lease parking because you right. need it, you just kind of need it. Yeah, I mean, I've done, I've done those agreements. Okay. And so it made sense to me. But once it became a requirement and all this, it just started turning into a nightmare. Well, um, with all due respect to staff, I'm going to go kind of go out on a limb here and say that um, I am of the opinion that Mr. Lear has been more than willing to try to get this through. Um, something. Um, I don't know who's in a winded area. I don't know if it's me, but if you could mute your phone. Um, but it sounds to me like this, mis I won't call it a mistake. Um, you know, everybody has makes mistakes. Um, but it sounds to me like the most beneficial thing to get Mr. Lear to, to build the project is to put in um, one of those pull-down ladders that you can find at Home Depot to allow access to the storage areas. Um, and uh, while I understand that it's not easy to crawl up into an attic space, and I certainly can't tell you how to provide access to your attic space, um, I will go on the record to say that um, I have heard from residents in that area that because uh, Mr. Lear I'm sure you're aware that um, 
people are asking us in fact we as planning commissioners are asking what the heck is going on with Lear Village why isn't this project finished yet and yeah. I appreciate you coming tonight and making this presentation because quite frankly I am of the opinion that the, um, you're doing everything that you can to push the project forward and, and I think as a planning commissioner um, it's our job to help you bring it home to the finish line um, so um, that's all I have at the moment I'm, I'm sure I will have other questions that come up um, but uh, I, I wish you all the best I, I want to see the project finished as do the local residents and I want to be able to go to the post office and look across the street and say yeah we helped Mr. Lear bring that home so um, I'll reserve any other questions until we, uh, as if I have any other questions, as my other fellow commissioners bring their points up. But thank you for joining us tonight. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for saying. Thank you for saying that. That actually, that actually did something. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Stroman. Uh, Commissioner Willis, any questions? A few statements and then a couple of questions. Um, I was wondering what the age uh, is expected to be of the residents here. If they're older people, they won't want to mess with ladders or pull down ladders. If they're parents of a child or two, they won't want their yards uh, diminished by storage sheds. I don't mind the idea of the chain link cages but it sounds like the residents would be able to secure their belongings and then the warehouse materials would be open. I'm not sure that's too palatable to the company that would be moving in there. Um, Mr. Lear, do you have any comments on any of those statements? Um, they're all good points, <laughs> right? Um, uh, I'm not sure on the age. I think it could be a variation of almost anything. Um, I think as rentals, these get tough a little bit because of the HOA. But the cost of renting nowadays is just almost astronomical. And, and in California, you know, we're not finding very many private, mar you know, private sector creative solutions to the issues that we're facing really here with affordable and modern income housing. So... I'm not sure, you know, I mean, the storage units themselves were going to be below the fence, so you wouldn't be able to see them. Um, and you're right, as far as attic, attic storage goes, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if, it, you know, they might need somebody to help. I mean, I think of this, too. My mom, you know, she has Alzheimer's now. My dad's taking care of her at 76, and so I'm kind of thinking and just saying a lot about them and seniors in general. I think senior housing is something we really do need there at Escalon. But um, just how do you get it to market? How do you make it all pencil? So that's I really the toughest mind, thing. I, yeah. I might not mind a pull-down ladder if I was just putting up a tub of Christmas decorations. I don't like the idea of a person having to have a ladder if they don't have to pull down ladder. Um, and then the option of having a cage out there for, for other things, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I'm i sorry. I, uh, this is Commissioner Stroman again. If you put, Mr. Lear, if you put these quote-unquote cages in, are you saying that you would still build or you would convert the building or where is this magical cage going? Building D. Building D as in dogs? Yes. Well, if, but I thought we began the conversation by Mr. Lear saying that and, and Diana saying that by making building D the storage building, it didn't pencil out, and that he would be losing money by putting storage in that in that building. So I guess I'm confused. Well, well, Sean, if the building is considered warehouse storage, 
I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Lear, it, it's a lot cheaper to build a warehouse storage building than it would be to, to have a built-in storage building that would house flammables and maybe need to be sprinklered, et cetera, et cetera. If you put restrictions on what could actually go into those, uh, to that warehouse storage, uh, that reduces the cost is what I understand. Um, it's not so much that actually. It's uh, um, the building itself was going to be an investment property, so it's supposed to be kind of like this, this long-term rental type thing that made sense for both the development of it and for the homeowners themselves. Now, it becoming a requirement, like you having to provide it, it becomes an infrastructure cost. And then it also reduces the value of the individual townhouses itself. So that's where you get the negative $300,000 of value to the, to the entire development where the margin's already deplorable. And, you know, wipes out any margin, even after me going out there and saving the money by doing what I did. That's the only thing I'd save the margins at all, actually. Otherwise, it'd be no margin to this project. In fact, it would be a loser all the way. So, so Mr. Mr. Lear, uh, please yeah. excuse my language, but yeah. are you saying that if we, if you had to build Building D as a storage building, you would essentially be losing your ass on this project? Horribly, really badly. Thank you. Yeah. As a requirement, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Willis, you said you had a couple things. Anything else? No, I think I said everything I wanted to say. Okay, Thank great. You. Thank you. Okay, uh, Vice Chair Castellanos? A uh, couple of questions. I'm, I'm kind of confused. Are the residential portion of this development going to be for sale or for rent? Well, th th this makes sense to me because this is a confusing project, especially here in the Valley, right? This is a really confusing... I mean, if we were like in inner city Fresno or Sacramento, you know, people are around this a lot, I think. Um, these are individual single-family residences. They each have their own separate utilities, just like any other house in any other development. They're just smaller space areas. So when you look at this development from the outside, you probably drive around thinking, oh, look at that apartment complex, or oh, those must be some weird trade of condos. They are not that. These literally are individual single family residences with all of the building code requirements to be just that. So they're individual little homes is what they are. And I mean, you own all the airspace as far as I know, you know, over the top of those as well and everything else. So. They're not condos, they're not apartments, they're not duplexes. This is not more, it's single family residence. Okay, so my question is, is when they are built, are you renting mm -hmm. them or are you selling them? Well, the first four in building A, I had always, I had always intended to sell right away just to cover the debt on the project. Uh, the little house there, it could be for sale or rent. These don't really work as investment properties because there is the HOA. So already at $275 a month for the HOA, what do you rent a 900 square foot, two, store, two beds and two baths for? Okay, so, so they kind of don't work. So it could go either way. I mean, I, I, might, I wanted to hold on to some as rentals and then just sell enough to pay down the debt, but there have been cost overruns, so I might have to sell the majority of these, and I may just be left with the two little units behind the main office. Okay, so and the, then the storage building has to go with the commercial office. So everything else would be sold. So the question is, is mm -hmm. the, the commercial building going to have an HOA also? Yes, yeah, it's included as part of the mixed-use development. Okay. Yeah, this is this, yeah, this is a mixed-use, so it's commercial, residential, living together side-by-side, side, and this is how we kind of make it work. So basically, I, all, I, all the structures and all the common areas are all part of the HOA. That's correct. Okay. So my second now there, there's a provision though. There's a provision within the CCNRs that we've we've made so many revisions to the CCNRs. And I told Diana, I said, Diana, 
these are expensive attorneys. We're already 4,000 over budget just from the CCNR because we keep looking back at this. Let's let the Planning Commission make a decision. City Council accept it, and then we'll we'll draft it the way they want it. <laughs> you know, it'll just be because I'm guessing right now. <laughs> I'm guessing what you got. You know how you'd like to see those written. But uh, in the latest revision, the CCNR attorney has specified that because of its commercial use and its attachment to the main office building that it be responsible for for more use on on that particular parking lot there and so it will it will take the burden of uh it will take the burden some of the burden off the hoa and put it more on the commercial office because of the use in and out of that store, out of that warehouse essentially okay so my next question with yeah. hoa is what what items does the HOA pay for? So I, I heard I heard the parking. Parking lot. Yeah, parking it, I mean, lot. replacing them replacing them down the road. The yeah, carport, restriping. replacing them. You know, you know putting... Restriping. Or, okay, what else? Um, the aesthetic. It, I, I'm not sure it covers aesthetics on, on um, C and E, What's uh, the but aesthetic? it does cover... Building sure C and building E. Well, what, what's C the aesthetics? The outside exterior? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so it's going to maintain the landscaping? Yes. Okay, so landscaping all, all, all exterior lighting. There's around 30, 32 exterior lights for, okay, for so walkway paths. Okay, are, is it going to be painting the buildings, repairing the... Yes roofs yes okay so uh, yes there's some reserves i believe also in there for the roof as well yes on building a and b okay what do you mean building a what about the other buildings a uh, building b is what well they share they building a where there's four tenants that share one singular roof it makes more sense uh, I guess to, you know, cover that in the HOA. We're putting a brand new roof on both of those, by the way. So they're going to be the best that you can get. Right? It's basically these are brand new buildings. I mean, so we're using the bones. That's how we call it. But I mean, they're like almost stand up. By the time we're done with the structural and new stucco, and we're furring out the interior perimeter wall and building A, I'm, I'm telling you, these are going to be like brand new buildings. It just still makes sense to actually use that structure. People don't really understand that, but it just really does. Um, so I'm, I'm confused. So. I would think if you have an HOA that all the structures in the development, if it, yeah. they're going to pay for the roof, regardless if it's commercial or the, or the yeah. storage building or it's a, a yeah. four unit attached or if it's a, a two story townhouse, you mm -hmm. know, all the roofs are going to be covered. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out the 200 and some odd dollar a month association dues I'm, like why is it so high that seems really expensive so i'm guessing it's it's some yeah. exterior maintenance that it's going to be taking care of the structures because there's not a lot I of think parking. there's not a lot of parking considering how big these slots are and the lot coverage and you know i'm just trying to figure out you know what those costs are you know and you know sure and you know i'm I'm looking at as a planning commissioner that this development is going to be in our downtown area. Mm -hmm. These are going to be pretty high density developments. Mm -hmm. My concern is there's going to be no area to, and Americans collect junk. Just ask any mini storage place <laughs> that's full. I mean, Mm -hmm. Go down and ask him if you can rent a storage facility. There's nothing available. People collect junk. Where yeah. are the tenants going to put their junk on these really small lots if they don't have storage? Well, I mean, you know, this is probably more commonplace, like I said, in an inner city, right? Like San Francisco or Fresno or. I don't want to I be honestly think Cisco or Fresno. I want to be Escalon. Well, yeah, of course. No, no, no I 100% agree, and I, I don't think you're going to find this type of development in any of those cities either, to be honest with you. I mean, this is going to, from my perspective, going to be a little Del Rio right freaking in downtown Escalon. So for me, 
I think you're going to see this when it's done as, wow, this is super impressive, and I think Esplan's going to get a big A-plus for it, I mean, honestly. But I think that what I'm trying to say is that in these inner cities, they don't have a lot of storage. Just, and I know that we got to work within the local community and what's more custom or the traditions or the culture of what people do in this area. You know, a lot of people have boats and four-wheelers and you know, RVs, which, you know, there's a lot of those types. That's the mentality. So this is a little progressive for the city. And, I mean, we're, I think we have actually larger backyards than a lot of these types of things have, actually. So, you know, this is kind of your take on, you know, valley living inside of this type of unique development, and it's progressive. So most people now, I think, are going towards uh, simplicity. They don't want to maintain their yards. They don't want to have to deal with the, ha the hassle of it. This is a very unique plan development, kind of proof of concept a little bit for the valley. So I, I think it's a really good point that that could happen, but, this, but the CCNR is also addressed that you cannot have like your bike hanging over the fence and you just can't have that. I mean, these CCNRs are so specific. It's 111 pages. There's so many things you're not allowed to do because it's the, the priority for this development. It's also for the tenants, but it's also to help value. The priority is the overall aesthetics of the development that the landscape around the entire city block is always maintained forever. That it's state mandated within the HOA budget, you can never ever change that. That all of the city lighting, the lights stick on all the same time, the signage, that it's gonna be maintained in this pristine condition and it's your entry into downtown Escalon. I think it's, it's an absolute like you know, inspiration for other business owners to say, hey, why don't we do something with our facade? We call it Hollywood Front. Why don't we do something cool? Why don't why don't we take you know part in this kind of renovation thing? That's that whole Main Street revitalization approach. So it's kind of a give and take a little bit, and you try to do as much as you can to fit within the culture of what's happening there and the local customs. And some of the design was taken off of your city buildings. Actually, the same designer conceptualized it. Actually, conceptualized that medical building there in the corner. So. I'm trying to fit within that, and it's that this give and take of how do we accommodate all of this but still have something we can build and sell, even though the margins aren't great, there's at least something. And in this particular development, because everybody's kind of learning on it, including myself in some ways, there's parts of this for sure, that how do you do this and bring something really cool to the city that's gonna quadruple the property value on that corner and provide additional property taxes to the city and in my opinion, it is way more than that because other people will start to do things. Like, they just will. There'll be an inspiration to what's happening there. So it's just kind of giving. Like, how do you how do you make everybody happy? It's just it's a tough thing. I feel like. Well, I just want to. I, 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 you know, I, you know, I dream. Of, I always say this. I say, you, you know, real estate development. You know, dream a dream, dream a dream. I don't dream a dream. I sit in a corner like a little nerd and I analyze numbers and I try to mitigate the risk and then I want to bring something to fruition. So if the margins aren't there, who cares? I have a passion for this. I really want to be building modern income housing as a career. And because I think middle, Amer middle America, honestly, from my ideology is just, it's not, I don't think America is treating that, it's treating that right. So anyways, I'll get off of that, but. Well, I'm just, I'm just hoping that, the, you know, I think it's a great that it's going to get development that, that part of Coley, we have a whole lot of new stuff being built that's making that. Yeah that stretch look really nice. My concern is is that yeah. you know you don't want to have a detriment that there's no storage and somebody moves in and or buy move mm -hmm. moves in and rents and then says, Hey, mm -hmm. where am I gonna store my stuff? You know, I gotta go down to the mini storage and rent a storage, you know? I mean mm -hmm. you know, that's that's you know you know and that's you know that that's those are my concerns, and I, and and I, like Barbara yeah. said, uh, Chairman or Commissioner Willis, that you know, you know, if you're 26 years old, you're not, you're not gonna have problems running up and down a ladder, but you know, senior citizen, eh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, those are that's my concern is is the lack okay. of storage. And I'm trying to figure out if, you know, because that building didn't make sense uh, to, uh, for an HOA, but you can build it and then put a, a half bath in a 
building that's going to be used for storage, that seems like an expense that, you know, why? Um, well, I probably, I feel like maybe I didn't explain it very well, but it has to do with requirements. When you call it a requirement under this guise of required and deed restricted only for use by, it means that there's no income potential to that building at all whatsoever. So and because it's a requirement. Why put a bathroom that, in it? Okay, because we're changing use. So now we're looking at general warehouse and availability of overflow storage so that if, a, that if one of the residents wants to rent storage, they can rent it, but it, there's a cost associated. Now it's income producing. And well, it's also not a requirement for the development. So it doesn't detract from the value and it doesn't lower the borrowing power of any bu buyer bu buying on any of these individual units. So the value, literally, when you take that term requirement off and you become free market, Right away now, the building's worth at least its face value. At least it's worth what, what it's costing to build. Viable. So putting the, these extra things in there, it enhances the desirability of the building because you can use it for other things. And the viability, as long as it fits within the municipal and building code, which is at the discretion or whatever, whatever your code is there, the city of one, it fits those. So it just enhances the viability. I mean, there's a lot of businesses there in Escalon that have storage, a lot of them. They have general warehouse storage. I mean, Bob DeGrasse and just did that down the street. You, you see that right around the corner, all over the place actually in the city of Esplan, you see this. This one's just gonna be really nice because we were required to build it to these very specific architectural relief guidelines. So I call it the Taj Mahal because it, it more or less could have just been a metal building at $65 a square foot, but this thing is not that. It's double the cost. Well, so how do you cover the cost of building it? It's, it's got to be, you have to produce income on it somehow. Or, or the commercial office guy that buys that unit that's now required to buy that because of these deed restrictions, he has to be able to say, hey, I can have my office up here, and store some stuff back here, and it's viable for my business. So there's value. There has to be value. There's I, no I value. Understand. I understand that. that. I understand that. Okay. So my question, okay. you have still answered it, is why are you putting in a half bath? Just viability. I think it's good to have it out. I think it's nice to have it out there. I don't know. Why? I mean, I'll, I'll, everybody that's going to be I, I think I, that space are within, what, 100 feet of the building? Hopefully uh, they can make it back to their bathroom. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it, it, to me it seems like a, a really big expense to to pull sewer and water, you know. Okay, well, okay, here's an example. I guess here's an example. And I, I would say that this is, I would say this is in line with Bob DeGrasse, which is just down the street. He's an electrical contractor, I guess, and he does some other stuff. He has a main office warehouse building where his wife, I think, is in there with the kids and everything, and they've got a partial kitchen, and it's real nice, and they've got carpet. I think the kids play there. And then they've got where all his contractors come and go outside of that warehouse. Sometimes they're dirty, sometimes they're tracking mud, sometimes you've got workers coming in and out. They don't go into the nice office, which is really what main office, that's what that is. It's an extremely nice office. They go to the restroom, you know, in the warehouse in this case. That's where they would go. I also included a wash basin actually in the restroom in case you, in case you need to clean dirty boots or whatever. I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm within the guideline of general warehouse. so. For me, when I say it enhances desirability and viability for people that would be buying an office like that and get in that city that fits within what you see up and down that street or anywhere in downtown Escalon, it makes sense. It's, it's more desirable. It enhances the viability. And because this is already just a break-even building, it just helps the value. I'm just looking at value, and it does help the value. And it, to me, it makes sense that you would use it that way. I would. We, you know, we have a construction company right there on site. And I would absolutely go and use that bathroom if I was all covered in mud and not go through the very nice, beautiful main office. I just wouldn't do it. Okay. It's an issue we have even in our office. It's an issue, and that's not even really all that great. But we have constantly people tracking through there, these contractors. And, you know, it's almost like we should put a door on the outside because it's just a mess. And then the secretary says nobody can use her bathroom, you know, at all whatsoever because of what these are, you know, they're just messy. They're just, you know. It's just it's a little different. So 
I do like it for that purpose. It's at the back corner. I think it makes sense. You could have tools in the backyard area as well and be storing things back there and it also be dirty and you could have a hose bib on the outside of the bathroom. That makes sense. Or maybe washing things down there in the back. Just in general, I think it, I, I think it absolutely 100% fits within the use of what you would see in the city of Escalon. I do, but. Okay, well, thank you. I have no other questions. Chairman. Okay, uh, thank you, Vice Chair Cancellanos. Uh, so a couple questions uh, from comments for me. Uh, one being, um, you know, I think, these people, whoever, whether they're buying or renting, let's say they're buying, uh, you know, they're going to know what they're getting into, um, and they have to, you know, the responsibility goes on to them to deal with their with their storage. And I think these HOAs, uh, 100 and some pages of it, um, will go a long way to enforce that. Um, but with that being said, I think without uh, a lack of some sort of storage, which I think the proposal in building D will provide. Um, I think I think the courtyards could end up being um, hidden storage and, and adding up and causing some issues. So I like the idea of of the storage in building D being uh, if you want it you can get it. If you don't want it you don't have to. Um, as for the attic storage, um, I mean if it's not required. To me, there's only one storage unit that makes any sense, and that's in Unit C. Um, I mean, maybe you can put a box or two up in some of these and slide it, but once you have a couple boxes in there to get anything out, you're pulling everything. Um, plus, the ladder has to go up there. So, I mean, to me, most of the well, all but maybe one or two don't make don't make any sense. And like I said, people know what they're gonna what they're getting into when they purchase it. Um, but with that being said, I'm wondering, and I'm certainly not going to make this a, any type of condition or anything, but uh, Mr. Lear, I, I just, I was thinking of the um, parking uh, carport, mm -hmm. and yeah. one of, uh, when we were uh, first, first married, uh, we had a, you know, a carport, and at the front of it was, um, you know, at, at that point, they weren't very nice storage cabinets, but they were storage mm -hmm. cabinets that I could put a padlock on. That was our storage in our 900 square foot two bedroom. Uh, actually, it was a fourplex. Um, you know, we didn't have anything else inside. We didn't have an attic, and you know, we filled it, but we dealt with it. Um, you know, I'm just throwing it out. Maybe that's a consideration. I know there's probably some um, concerns about. You know how that would look. I'll leave that up. Leave that up to you, just to just to consider. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm I'm of a strong. I guess at this point, I, I don't have any other questions for you. I guess that was maybe more just a lot of comments. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure, so I'll close I'm familiar. You I'm part. familiar with what you're talking about, but yeah. Uh, yes, Commissioner Wilson. Questions. Uh, Mr. Lear, um, I live in a subdivision that has CCNRs, and mm -hmm. uh, there's not a lot of interest in enforcing them, and people break them. And who's going to be enforcing the CCNRs for this PD? Will that be you? Um, yeah, initially it will be me. The way that it's set up, I use a CCNR attorney who just specializes in this down at Fresno. He's a really, really good guy. Um, so I'm just going with what industry standard. I like to use industry standard as often as possible and not get too creative in that way. Um, so I have the majority of the voting rights right now, and you know I've managed 50, 60,000 square foot of commercial office space. But I was actually very personally responsible for managing that space in that way. So. I will be managing the on-site for now. Um, at some point, um, the homeowners can manage it. They'll vote in a president who helps to maintain that. Typically, I guess in your subdivision this didn't happen, but in small communities like this, you'll probably find someone who almost wants to be the president to make sure that this happens. There, there's like penalties and liens and other things you can do. I know the, I know the one 
there's a development there down Briggsmore, and they're really big about enforcing their HOAs, but, you know, that's professionally managed. Um, there's, I'm sure, a cost associated with that, but um, they almost over-enforce them. But I have a feeling, you know, if there's weeds to, if there's just something awry on that project or building, you know, residents call in. I have a feeling that the, whoever's at the city level, you know, they're probably going to call the president of the HOA and make sure that they're enforcing those HOAs just because of its proximity or location there in the city. Okay. I have a feeling Second that question. it's probably always good. Yeah. Second question, which of the units can afford to have pull-down ladders with storage above? You know, it came as a surprise to me that he said the pull-down ladders wouldn't work. And that they really should have all worked because they're like coming off of hallways and so I don't know if I just you know look back at, what, at his comments there but to me the ladder should have worked everywhere um, I'm not sure why that what was going on there we did have drop ceilings like in building A and in building B and so we went away from drop ceilings we're gonna actually frame those now so they can take the load of whatever's being put in that area um, but I'm not sure why I, yeah because I would prefer a, a drop down ladder over moving a ladder there myself too even from a build perspective I think it's a better idea and from, uh, a, like, from an access standpoint I mean even if somebody was um, I, got you. I don't know middle aged it makes better sense to go over I mean right now I, I have a single story home and all I have is a sheet of sheetrock with a piece of insulation on it in my crawl space and I sure would like that drop it drop down ladder as opposed to having a piece of yeah. sheetrock in the hallway you know yeah I agree and, and I'm in that case too Sean and, and I, would, I would agree with that however I would I would rather and prefer to leave that as an option of the build to uh, the developer to offer that to a potential buyer and include that in a, an additional cost. Because uh, again, I'm going to go with uh, what Commissioner Castellanos is saying. People have junk. Uh, I think the ability to be able to rent one of these uh, proposed cages out there uh, affords that. It looks like you're going to build Building D anyway, and yeah. it, nobody's requiring you to pull uh, electrical. Oh, I don't know about the electrical, but the sewer for your uh, half bath. If you wanted to do that, I, you know, that's fine. But uh, that's a cost that you know about. I, I just, you know, I, I've got to add a crawl space too. And like Sean said, there's a sheetrock and some insulation up there. And let me tell you. I don't feel real good, and I got a lot of room up there. I got more than four feet. I can stand up in it, and it, uh, you know, if I slip, trip, fall, I'm I'm through that ceiling there. So if there's no flooring, if you will, uh, that just doesn't really make sense. I, I mean, people can throw uh, uh, plywood up there, I guess, but uh, I don't know if the opening's big enough for it. So I'm gonna get on my soapbox for a second, and. I'm going to go back to when my grandmothers were alive. And when my grandmothers were alive, they both lived in three-story homes in, in Pennsylvania. And as they grew older, and I'm sure but we've all been there with our grandmas, all they wanted to do was get rid of their stuff. Just get rid of it. Give it to grandkids. <laughs> Give it to great gang grandkids. Just, just get rid of it. I got to get rid of all this stuff. And I mean, yeah, I, I, if, uh, if I was a new couple, uh, such as uh, Chairman Sarkozy mentioned, newly married, I would say, okay, where am I gonna put my stuff? But if you're newly married, you know, you're not gonna try to look at one of these units. You're gonna try to find something else. And so I, I just see us going around and around and trying to enforce this, and I will quote, requirement for storage for something that quite honestly in my opinion why drive the cost of the project up to try to enforce a 
require quote requirement for storage that I understand it's municipal code but uh, Mr. Lear I, I don't mean to use this term testified or notified us um, that he has done everything possible to, for this project and it was up to the plan reviewer and their interpretation of multifamily versus single family why we're meeting in the first place and so uh, I don't know maybe maybe a year from now this maybe we'll see the uh, Lear community storage property go up I, I don't know you know it's, uh, but I, I'm just seeing and I, I can appreciate um, what my fellow commissioners have said I just I am very hesitant on trying to force this quote requirement onto Mr. Lear. I'll leave it at that. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Um, with that, is, is there any other questions during the uh, public hearing? Okay, uh, with that, at 841, we'll close the, close the public hearing. And uh, any clarifications from commissioners to staff based on what we've just heard? Mr. Chair, okay. just, just for the record, I, I would like staff to confirm uh, what Mr. Uh, Lear stated uh, in the record during public comment that yes, it was a matter of an interpretation of multifamily versus single family by the plan reviewer. This is Diana. So when it comes to zoning code and the requirement for storage, that did not have anything to do with the CSG plan reviewers. The city of Escalade zoning code says that R2 density um, projects require secure storage. That is separate from what happened with CSG, which is true. When Mr. Lear submitted his plan set for building A, the plan checkers at CSG originally categorized it as multifamily, which had different requirements than if it was single family. And it did take a few months uh, for the plan checker to call Mr. Lear back and make the correction that they were gonna plan review it under single family. But that did not have anything to do with the storage requirement. Storage requirement is city municipal code. So Diana, just for my own uh, information and the, about my fellow commissioners, so obviously a tentative plan and parcel map came before the planning commission um, and we talked about the storage prod, uh, building way back when. At what step of the project does or is the zoning code reviewed with the plan reviewer? I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out what can we can avoid, what we can do to avoid this problem in the future for other applicants. I mean, is it the applicant's responsibility to understand the zoning code of R1, R2, and when they're going through the working drawing stage, or, or when can, how can we avoid this problem in the future? That's a great question. Um, the zoning code and the building code, as it applies to the storage, don't really overlap. Um, the plan reviewer uh, made the mistake on the townhomes and it came to where the yards were located. It was it was really a, a building code interpretation as and as Mr. Lear had said, this is kind of an unusual project for this area. We don't get a lot of projects like these. So it's not something that the plan reviewer had a lot of experience in. Um, so it was an honest mistake uh, in the way he interpreted the building code, which he did correct. Well, D D Diane, if I may, in March of 2017, CSG Consultants did come back with preliminary contact on the BTSM before it was submitted just a few months later. And they did in fact say that we needed ADA parking for building A, which they had been interpreting as multifamily. So it was at that time, it wasn't, it also happened later, but it did, that came back before we even submitted the BTSM. And all of those six different criteria also confirmed that the approach was multifamily. So let me ask you a very loaded question, staff. I'm sorry, whoever just made that big sigh. <laughs> uh, but if this project were to be considered 
multifamily? Would we, instead of single family, would we still be having this discussion on storage tonight? And I, I think the answer is yes, because of the zoning, the R2 zoning, but I, I just wanna know what staff's thoughts are on that. Yes, you're correct. Because the zoning, the density, the number of housing units he has on the amount of acreage that he has is R2 density, it requires the storage. That being Thank said, you. It is a planned development, meaning that uh, requirements are fluid. There's give and take. You increase something here, we'll let you uh, be flexible over here. So that's where we come into those six different options where it ranges from you can require no storage to you can require storage as originally proposed. The planning commission has that discretion under a planned development to make those recommendations and city council has uh, the discretion to adopt those requirements because it is a planned development. Okay, so uh, thank you, Diana, for the explanation. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I would only add that uh, it's unfortunate that uh, sometimes when the, the wording, you know, if it comes out, if, if, if there's a couple different options and the first option is because of the zoning it's required um, we kind of focus on that versus the second option which uh -huh. is uh, equally equally available to us that it's a planned development and we've got some options um, so it's um, good to remember that uh, uh, there's more than one way to look at things okay uh, any other uh, Last comments, commissioners? If not, we have a couple things we need to decide on. Is the public hearing closed? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Uh, was somebody saying something? Okay. Uh, so. Uh, we've got a number of options we can uh, make a motion on. Um, are there any motions on the table? Uh, before we get, get to the motion, I'd like to say uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Lear, for coming in and explaining uh, what took so long and where things have gone and, and uh, from your perspective. Uh, I, I'm sure we've all been enlightened tonight. I want to uh, express my thanks to the fellow commissioners. Uh, some great questions and uh, pointed insight, uh, as well as staff. So uh, good job, everybody. Um, I, I know that there's a, a second part of this that's going to be uh, presented to the city council regarding fees, and not to get into that, but I hope that uh, with our decision tonight, that, uh, because of some of the uh, integration of the city taking so long that they may uh, rule in, in Mr. Lear's favor and give him some relief uh, along those lines, but that's out of our daily way. All we have is what's before us and, and what we've got. So I'd like to start out and uh, knock me down if you want. Uh, I, uh, I think we ought to go ahead and approve the uh, changes, uh, the sizes, of, uh, for staff's uh, suggestion and then getting to the storage I would uh, I'm all in favor of number five which is uh, in, in so much as building D is going to be built and uh, the applicant wants to put in a bath in there that's, that's his purview uh, but I think that there should be these metal cages at the very least available through the CCR, the HOA, uh, uh, an opportunity for the tenant, whether they rent or they buy, uh, to be able to use those. Um, if you want to do attic storage, I think that's your prerogative, but I think that should be your prerogative and an agreement between the future owner or, or tenant to include that in their payment, uh, or to whatever the, uh, the, the office is. So, um, let me see. How, how do I put that, uh, Don? 
We were going to. Uh, uh, Commissioner, Commissioner uh, Danziger. Can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So you mentioned option number five. However, aren't you referring to what is sort of a hybrid approach between option four and option five, which allows Mr. Lear to modify the building D and then put in the cages and offer the first right of refusal to the, the residents to purchase um, units to allow access to those cages if possible? Isn't, isn't that what you're saying? Yeah, I believe you're right. I believe you're correct. Um, and, and, and again, I, I get, uh, I, I'm not sure which way Mr. O'Leary is going to go. So yes, I would, I would go with that, make that the, uh, uh, the standard. And if he wants to enhance that and, and build, you know, permanent storage units there, then, then he could look into that with staff. But that would not be, uh, Commissioner Danzer, you're not recommending that that attic. Applicant the 
question, and that's where we left off. Okay. Can you hear me now? That's great, yes. Okay, very good. So did you guys reopen? Yes. Hold on. Did you guys reopen the meeting, the public hearing? Uh, we did, yes. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Lear, I asked a question that obviously you, I don't know if you heard me or not, but I asked if we considered this hybrid approach and removed the word re requirement um, and allowed you to have access to uh, or offer the storage as well as for both the, the business up front as well as the general warehouse going yeah. and re remove the word required. Does that help you in any way with financing for the project? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Thank this you. conference will now be recorded. Or, or, Mr. or Chair Sarkozy. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. That. Uh, Clears things up. So, uh, 8:56. We will close the public hearing again. I'm not and sure I agree with having uh, option number five be included because that's the way it was originally approved. I don't think we're doing that at all. We're basically doing number four uh, with the option of having the cages. include number five, yeah, I think that's confusing. Yeah, that's, that's the way I intended it, uh, Commissioner Willis. Uh, you're right, I don't think it's a hybrid between four and five. The only thing that they have in common is there's going to be a building. So, yeah, I, I my, my proposal was just uh, for number four, because I think that uh, encompasses what's going to help Mr. Lear and will also allow the tenants to have a storage area. Uh, that they can uh, utilize or not. I guess I'm iffy Listen. on the attic storage with the pull-down ladders because when I see them work, they're usually out in a garage, not in a home. And and I've had to see them be shored up with magnets because they get kind of sloppy. Uh, I like it as having them as an option, but I'm not firm on that. Commissioner Willis, have you ever watched uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation? Of course not. Okay. <laughs> you check it out because Chevy Chase, Chevy Chase has a pull-down ladder that you should uh, watch. And for the staff, yes, I did reference National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. <laughs> so does that support my view or not support my view? It does not support – well – it does not support your view only because <laughs> the ladder that Chevy Chase accesses the ladder is actually in a hallway. But check it out. It's a good laugh. So I'd be willing to go with just option four, or if we wanted to add to it the attic storage, uh, fine or not, it doesn't have to be. Option four is good in my view. Is that, are you seconding that, Commissioner Willis, or? Before you second, this is Diana. If I could just clarify what the recommendation is going to be um, as I've taken notes from everybody's comments. So, Building D, uh, Building D, the request to modify the use floor plan and elevations to general warehouse storage. Uh, it's owned and utilized by the commercial business on Main Street. The business cannot be used for living quarters. It cannot be leased or utilized by any person or business that's not a Lear Village owner or tenant. Um, the residents have the option to pay for that overflow, overflow chain link storage unit within Building D. They do not have to take it if they do not want it but the owner of Building D, if a resident wants it, is required to lease them a space. So, you know, at minimum, if, if all eight residences want their metal or their chain link storage unit, the commercial business would have to put up those eight storage unit chain link fences for them. Uh, the residents would access those chain link storage units during the commercial office's business hours. 
it wouldn't be a 24 hour access. Um, Commissioner Danziger mentioned the developer would have the ability to limit the materials that the residents can store, such as flammable items, if that posed a problem for the way that the building is constructed and occupied. Um, so that would be built like into the CCNRs. And then attic storage is an option that the developer can build if they want, but they're not required to. So those are the notes that I have on it. Correct me if I'm wrong. Diana, I don't like the condition that says that the, the um, tenants are required to access the spaces during normal working hours of the business because for those of us that work eight to five and I'm hanging up my Christmas lights on Saturday morning, I won't be able to, I'll have to leave work early to enable to gain, to get access to my Christmas lights. And so I think it should be considered a shared space um, and access. I would say access during normal hours, um, not necessarily during um, business hours. So this is something we'll have to discuss with Mr. Lear because the way the commercial or the way building B is proposed to set up is it's an open floor plan. The commercial business on Main Street has the keys to the building. And so the tenant would go to the office, let them know he wants to access his storage building. They would take him over and let him in and probably monitor him while he's in there getting his stuff because it's open floor plan. That resident would have access to the commercial buildings materials that are inside um, so I think that's why Mr. Lear said it would be during business hours because they would need someone from the from the office to let them in Mr. Lear do you have any thoughts on that you know um, you, you actually see a lot of this kind of stories nowadays they, they call it flex office a lot of times in, in the flex space here so you know I think like this my brother did something on this recently um, it's so many of these things we try to go boilerplate and put it on a contract but it's so interpersonal and kind of how how it's done locally so if you're really comfortable and a lot of times we got to know our tenants so well we would have parties and different things and everybody would come hang out and it's kind of how we had our buildings always be full you get to know these people and generally you're not like monitoring them really it's like that <laughs> so just Typically, we weren't, you know, it's a very, it's like on the more rare occasion that you say, oh, I got to really watch that guy. So we could maybe put a camera inside there, but then it kind of opens it up to maybe we're responsible for the liability if something were to get hurt in there at that point. It might be more expensive on the insurance. Um, but it makes sense to me what you're saying, because if you've got people working, basically what you're saying is you don't want it too restrictive, that if they're able to, you know, access that, they should be able to access it, you know, even if it's till nine o'clock maybe at night or something, or till seven o'clock at night, or they should just have the availability of access to this overflow storage, you know, if, the, if, if, if they need it. And that kind of does make some practical sense to me. What if you so, have a coded entry? Yeah, so I was thinking, you know, it, yeah, immediately when he said that, I thought we gotta put key fob on there probably. You probably need okay. key fob and maybe a camera too, just in case, just for whatever reason, but maybe we just go key fob, it's a more expensive door, but I think if it satisfies the requirement, you know what I mean, maybe we go key fob. And then, you know, that's just part of it. They get a key fob access and they can basically go in and out of there whenever they, almost whenever they would like. But we could still put it within the, I'll probably have a separate store, like overflow agreement for these tenants, almost like a commercial lease. So it'll be like a lightweight commercial overflow storage lease, and we'll have rules and regulations. And inside of those rules and regulations, we could make like you know the hours to be within you know till 9 p.m. at night. Or if you had suggestions there, I'd be open to those. You know, if you had a time like you know from 8 a.m. in the morning till midnight, or till 10:30 at night, or something till 10 o'clock at night. Somebody might go there after that, but but just so that they understand, it's supposed to be with kind of within this time frame. I I, I, I mean I, I like that suggestion of a key fob or or something of that that manner, but I'm a little reluctant to 
uh, even have to address this um, as, as any type of requirement. I think that can be dealt with with the homeowners association or some site of uh, contract uh, that Mr. Lear was um, was discussing. So I, I'm, I'm more of the opinion to um, take any time frame out of um, out of what we're approving tonight. Um, I would second Chair Sarkozy's comments. I think we're getting into the weeds as far as accessing the storage building that quite honestly as planning commissioners it's not our issue to resolve. Our issue is to deal with the storage unit at hand and however Mr. Lear works it out with the, the tenants or the tenant of the warehouse building as well as the, the single family homes, that's Mr. Lear's issue to resolve, not ours as planning commissioners. So other than the time reference, what Diana read sounds like just what we've all been saying. I agree. I agree. Can, can, can I just make, just so there's not a confusion later, that it's overflow storage that I, that the, uh, whoever the owner is, in this case it's me right now, would be leasing at market value. And, mar and fair market value would be whatever kind of the joint rate is, just so it's understood that it will be leased. <laughs> there will be a cost associated and and that also, I mean, it's, it's fine that it's, it's over full storage on the, on the, on the first uh, choice. I think we can make all of that work. So just Mr. that to be, to be leased at market value. So Mr. Lear, I think a win-win, and I can't speak for my fellow commissioners, but I think a win-win would be to put the attic storage as an option as well as over, or if they don't want to access the overflow in the attic, and they can lease this other extra storage in that building. There we go. It's a win-win. That works. I we think keep, that works. We keep, using, we keep using the phrase um, first right of refusal. Can someone explain that just so I make sure that we're all on the same page what that means? Well, yeah, that so would be... Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, well, I'll take okay. a stab at it. It would just be that uh, the homeowner, if the homeowner chooses to have a uh, storage um, cage, whatever we want to call it, in Building B um, at the time when they purchase it, that they have the there will be a a unit available for them. If they refuse. Uh, after that point, there's no guarantee that there would be one available. Um, that, that, that's how I would summarize it. What happens what if happens one sells? Like, it's sold. I, I couldn't hear you. What did you say? What happens, what happens if, it if it resells? Well, I, I, I take that as there were there will always be eight spaces um, available, okay. or um, yeah. So it, if if it resells, there there has to be, and if that means that the commercial business has to rearrange something that they've moved into, then I think um, they would need to do that. Okay. Okay. Would, would, would that be within a certain like time frame, like we could say within 30 days or 60 days, or does it need to be made like immediately available within three days or 50 years? Is, is, 50 years is okay. <laughs> I'm being well, I mean, facetious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just, just so I don't get caught up in semantics, you know, so we... So we have a reasonable frame of sight, and then maybe it needs to be right away. But, but um, just in case somebody, because I, I, this is what I think is going to happen. I think you're going to have four to six of those, maybe at least the, the other one's not. Probably. Yeah, I mean, I, I would if we want to put a time frame. I'm, I mean, I think people are going to know pretty quickly if they uh, if if they need one or want one and want to pay for it. Yeah. Um, so right. I mean, I think if we need to throw a date on there. 30 days is is fine with me okay well i mean they can probably you know at any time say hey i want storage it could be at any time during the month or any time during the year 
but just for the commercial office user who's you know storing something there so if they're they say okay well i've got to move some things out of there because they do have the right it's within the deed restrictions so we're going to go ahead and do that they have to comply and we'll also address it in the hoas and the ccnr it's actually the ccnr so we address the hoas separate separate 70 pages <laughs> but um <laughs> well um but but they have maybe 30 days to figure out whatever they do and provide that storage unit so that's that's probably fair, 30 days. Sounds good to me. Yeah, me too. Okay. Okay. This is Diana. So I'm just going to clarify that one more time. So the original homeowner, as these are originally sold, they have the fir first right of refusal, which means they have the option to pay for a storage cage or not. If they choose not to, and later they change their mind, they may you know the the commercial owner may give them a space or may not and then as time goes on and these uh, residences sell they either get a new owner or someone rents it out and there's a new tenant uh, if those individuals want a storage cage uh, they have a right to it and the commercial owner within 30 days will provide one for them is that right yeah i think that sounds great Sounds good to me. Okay, so um, Dan, do we need? Do you need to read back that entire thing for us to motion and second, or how, how do we? How can we do this? <laughs> There's a lot there. I don't think it hurts to just that I'll say it again. Um, so as you guys move forward, if you look on page five of seven of the staff report, someone will need to, number three, make a motion to make the findings for that section of the government code. And then four, make a recommendation to city council to amend the ordinance for the lot size and coverage. And then number five, make a recommendation to city council to amend condition of approval, uh, condition number 21 in regards to storage. And then what we, what you guys have uh, come up with, I have my notes, building D is going to, uh, where did my notes go? Condition D, building D, allow the requested modification to the use floor plan and elevation of building D to be a general warehouse storage building owned and utilized by the commercial business on Main Street. The building cannot be used for living quarters, cannot be leased or utilized by any person or business that is not a Lear Village owner or tenant. Attic storage is optional to the developer. It's not required. The developer has the ability to limit materials that residents can store within that storage building D. The resident will pay for the storage chain link units at market value. Uh, the homeowner has the first right of refusal when they purchase the home, and if they choose not to, uh, they may request it at a later date, but it's not guaranteed that they will get it. And then if there's a new owner or tenant in one of the units, they also have the first right of refusal, and if they elect to get a unit, the owner of storage building D has 30 days to provide that to them. <coughs> of information um, okay well uh, motion that we, we approve what Diana just read uh, to us all okay uh, there would, we have a motion second any second I would second that chair okay great so we have a motion and a second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. Aye. All those opposed, say nay. Great. Uh, motion passed 5 0. Uh, congratulations, uh, Mr. Lear. Appreciate the, the time and the discussion and uh, helping us come to uh, uh, what works for everybody. Mr. Chair, yeah, can I, I, thank can you. I ask Mr. Lear a question? Of course. Uh, Mr. Lear. 
Now for the million dollar question. <laughs> when, do you think, when do you think you're going to be done? You know, <laughs> this is the, you know what I've been saying this whole time. Because everybody looks at this project and they look at those buildings and they say, man, those buildings have a, lot, have a long way to go. And all I keep saying is, no, 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 no. It's just underground. It's just stupid tight underground. I hate this underground. So I think the buildings themselves really are not that difficult. You know, that's really kind of right up our alley, to be honest. All right, so uh, when are you going to be done? <laughs> I think he just, he just dropped the call. call. Okay. Well, a maybe good, good time. <laughs> Okay, uh, so next on the agenda is administrative um, matters from staff. Did we, did we lose somebody again? Uh, no, you, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you. Yeah, but it's echoing. Okay, um, I just had a few updates for you. Um, the first one, as you may notice down in the prospect area over by the former lumber yard, um, Mr. Grassi is moving forward with that project. So you'll see that that area is currently blocked off. Um, they're going to begin staking and grading in the next few weeks. Um, and that is phase one of the development of that area where that public parking uh, will be located um, and they are estimating four to six months for that portion to be completed. Uh, I, I'm, so I'm back. Um, we're me? looking forward to that moving forward. Um, oh, we yeah, had our council second, meeting Mr. last night okay. uh, where it was decided uh, that the council would like to return to physical meetings where we're all located at City Hall. Um, so effective in July, if we have a planning commission for the month of July, a meeting, uh, we will be restoring uh, back to um, chambers for the meetings and we will have some modifications being made to make sure that social distancing measures are being met. Um, so Hallelujah. it'll be great to see everyone's faces in person. Mm. Um, let's see. Um, and that is all I have at this time. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, can we, uh, I know Commissioner Stroman had a question for Mr. Lear. Can we uh, go back and, and let him answer that? <laughs> Are you back on the line, the David? Yeah, I'm back on the line. Okay. So do you remember what the question was, Mr. Lear? Yes, I do. <laughs> for sure I do. Um, I've been hesitant now because of just so many unexpected things on this project, but you know, real, really, the the, build, the building the building renovations alone really are not that complicated. Um, we've got really good detailed plans. We've got a good team we're putting together. You know, we're making a few modifications to that team. I and mean, my my major concern now is getting it done as absolutely as fast as possible. Um, I mean, there's eight, there's four million homes right now in forbearance right now in America. There's eight percent of the entire mortgage market. They just can't pay their mortgages, so we're having a little bit of a problem there. But we're in modern income housing. Escalon housing values are are strong. Uh, COVID does slow some things down. There's just some issues with getting materials even sometimes. There's some issues there, and I'm hoping that we don't have those issues as we move forward. The way they change the lending laws. Uh, when it comes to construction or innovation is I begin to pay interest the very day that I pull this loan. So my carrying costs go way up. So it's definitely in my favor to finish as absolutely as fast as possible. So that's my intent. And it's probably really not a bad time to borrow right now because we they keep printing this money. Uh, inflation makes it almost less to pay your debt back because the value of the dollar goes down. But so almost works in your favor with inflation a little bit if you go full tilt on debt. So I'm thinking that I'm going to go building A. What I'd like to do is the interior office on building or, or uh, building B, which is the office right at the same time, followed by the little house with the 
storage building envelope of B and then probably frame E and the storage building so we can complete the interiors covered as we go into November, December. And I'm really wanting the entire project to be done by March, but I'm, ho I'm actually going to be pushing for six months. I'm going to get as aggressive as possible. I'm just, I, I'm going to be pushing, pushing, pushing. I really want this thing to go up overnight, almost to probably prove a point a little bit. It's just been very difficult to get to this place and getting the subdivision map approved was almost like, just getting those improvements done was almost like a weight of the world off of my back finally to have those done. Because the improvement estimates that we got from our civil, or from our, uh, from United Paving, Cavanaugh, and Hensley, we were like 380,000 plus in those on-off sites. So for that to be done and that behind me, that was just a huge sigh of relief for me. But, well, I can't, so it's gonna be a, we're gonna be pushing. I can't speak for all 7,000 residents. Uh, I can only speak for myself, um, but we wish you the best of luck. Um, now it's crunch time. And so yeah, I, I hopefully, I hopefully we're there celebrating with you during the grand opening. And uh, I will say, get her done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, great, thank you. Okay, uh, let's see, this time uh, matters presented from the audience, if we have any callers. Uh, the public may address the Planning Commission on any non-agendized agendized item that is within the authority of the Commission. The speaker is limited to a maximum of five minutes. Unused time may not be yielded to another speaker. Uh, determination of whether this is within the authority of the Commission is a discretionary decision made by the Commission Chair. That being said, are there anybody from the public who would like to comment on anything? Okay, with that being said, um, moving on to staff communications. Um, I have no, no other ones than what I pro provided earlier. Okay. Um, and we'll go on to commission communications. How about if we start with uh, Commissioner Willis? Oh, I can't think of anything. All's good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Stroman? I always have something, Chair. Always. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that I, I wanted to say a thank you to uh, Councilman Alves and Councilman Leggero uh, for the interview last Monday. And um, I hope the interview went well. And I would greatly appreciate if you uh, lent your support to reappointing uh, Chair Sarkozy and myself for another four-year term to the Planning Commission. Um, it's been interesting. It's been fun. I, I've uh, learned, definitely learned a lot, and I want to continue to learn a lot. And I hope to be on the Planning Commission for many years to come, like uh, Commissioner Castellanos and Commissioner Willis. Um, however, if they choose otherwise, um, to my fellow commissioners, sure has been fun. And to city staff, thanks for all your hard work. But I really want to continue this uh, journey with the Planning Commission um, and, and continue to, to help represent the constituents of Escalon. Um, the only other thing is uh, we've kind of beat this horse to death, but um, I wish Mr. Lear all the best of luck and moving forward. And as always, big kudos and shout out to Diana and to Dominique for a well-prepared presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Thank Commissioner you. Danzinger. Well, I, I don't know, I didn't know if uh, Commissioner Stroman was uh, speaking for me uh, or anybody else, so uh, <clears throat> thank you. I, I would echo those sentiments. Um, I, I think uh, hearing from uh, Mr. Lear on the project really uh, clarified some things for me, as I, uh, I think did for the commission. I think staff did a tremendous job, gave us uh, great options, uh, what we're looking at here, and, and hopefully you know, this will be positive and the 
the project will move uh, along forward, uh, as Mr. Lear said, you know, very rapidly. Love to see that. Other than that, I'd say uh, it is great to see you all. I'm glad you're all there and healthy. And I, too, hope that uh, Chairman Sarkozy uh, and Sean Stroman are reappointed to the commission. Um, we have a, I think we have a really good commission, good rapport, good intelligence, and I, I echo with Sean. I, I learn a lot all the time. So uh, with that, uh, look forward to seeing you at our next meeting, uh, hopefully all of us at our next meeting in July. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Danzinger. Uh, Vice Chair Constellinos. Well, um, I, I'm always amazed. I, I read what's on the agenda, and then I go to the meeting and listen to the presentation, and my mind um, changes. So it was really beneficial to hear the presentation from Mr. Lear today. I was I was questioning, you know, like Sean has and everybody I know, the question of what's taking so a lot. I'm not seeing anything moving, so I'm hoping that uh, this is going to start moving forward in a good way. Um, you know, Diane and Dominique and the staff uh, really make our jobs easy and how well they lay out the presentations and, and everything. It's, it's real beneficial. Um, I've enjoyed working with everybody. I'm hoping that Mark and Sean are reappointed because I think you both are a real asset to this community, you know, and you, and you have strengths that some of us don't have. And, you know, Sean's always asked, in the tough questions, and I appreciate that. And, um, and thank you, Mark, for uh, sharing for one last time. Maybe this is the last. You'll be the only video chairperson. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing else to say. Just everybody be safe, and uh, looking forward to seeing you all uh, in July, hopefully. Thanks for your kudos, Steve yeah. and Kurt. Uh, yeah, um, certainly. Thanks to uh, everybody, also for your uh, your words. I certainly have uh, enjoyed it. Um, hoping to continue. Um, it's it's amazing. You know, the four years certainly have gone by quick. And um, it, I, you know, looking back on it, it. I mean, it, it takes a little bit of time to you know to even come up to come up to speed. Uh, there's a. I didn't think there would be a learning curve. Um, so even this last, uh, you know, year, year and a half, um, it. I don't know. It just uh, um, seems as understanding the process better. So uh, it, d it does take some time. Just, um, just, uh, just a comment. Uh, but yeah, uh, Commissioner Stroman um, certainly enjoy uh, uh, your rapport and. Um, Hope, uh, hope that you, you are able to continue uh, as well with me and appreciated um, the support from everybody uh, as I learned the procedures of my first time being a chair and stumbled times, but uh, hopefully learned from my mistakes. And uh, it is kind of funny that it's, uh, it ends up being a, a, a video one. So, um, so anyway, uh, thanks to staff again. Uh, what everybody said, I can't add too much. Just that it's uh, it's a pleasure um, seeing the the hard work you guys put into to all the agendas and reports. It's certainly appreciated. So thank you. Thank you to everybody. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, I think with that being said, at 9:29 we shall adjourn for the evening. And uh, everybody have a good rest of the week, and hopefully see everybody in July. Okay. Thank you. Good night. All right. See you all. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Take care, everybody. Good night. Hey, Kurt. Yes, sir.
I have a question for you on your profession on your former professional life. Um, can you give me a call whenever you get a second? I have a this have conference a is no longer being recorded. Absolutely. Uh, is tomorrow okay? Sure. Whenever you get a chance, no rush. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let me uh, let me go take care of the other half, and uh, I'll call you tomorrow. Sounds great. All right. Bye bye. Thanks.